This is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Tuesday, October 28th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of Robbery Homicide Division, Homicide Section. The boss is Captain Brown. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. 4.50 p.m. We had just finished a two-week jury trial. I caught up on some paperwork. Bill developed a new problem. you know, Joe. Yeah, what's that? Motorcycles. Oh, is that so? Figured I'd get the boy one for Christmas, but I gotta decide which one. Well, which one does he want? Well, he's kinda hung up on this Burrito 25, but I don't know if it's the right one for him. Why is that? Well, it's three horsepower, Joe. Not fast enough, huh? Oh, it's fast enough, all right. Pulls a pretty good hill, too, providing you have the right sprocket. Well, what's the problem, then? Too much money? No, I wouldn't say that. The price is right. Well, price is right, it's fast enough, it climbs okay. Now, what else is there? Joe, you don't understand. This three-horsepower model only has one seat. No, I guess I don't understand. Well, the boy's got to learn how to drive it. Where am I going to sit? Now I understand. I knew you would. Robbery homicide, Friday. Where is that? Okay, got it. Rooming house, 127 grand. Year? Yeah, multiple homicide just went down. How many victims? Three and no suspects. Five ten p.m. We arrived at the Grandee Rooming House. The first officers on the scene were Jim Smith and Bob Arnold. The success or failure of a homicide investigation can be directly related to the care used in preserving the crime scene. Smith and Arnold had performed their task well. We got the call at 16:30 hours. What was the call? Unknown trouble. We came in the front door. It was 16:45 hours. These people were standing out in the hallways. They all heard the shots. I asked them to come down and wait until you got here. They didn't observe anything except those two bodies lying over there on the floor by the TV set. Those people over at the table, you got their names? Right here. Where's the ambulance crew? Upstairs with Sergeant Doherty. A wounded man was found in the second floor hall. They're up getting him now. Name's Mort Baker, the apartment house manager. What about the building exterior? Sealed tight. Since we got here, nobody's been in or out. That's good. Sergeant Doherty roped off the area. Thought it would help protect the scene. How many have crossed into the scene and upstairs since you arrived? Five. My partner and I, when we first got here, we looked over the three floors and sealed them off. Since that time, only Sergeant Doherty and the two ambulance attendants have been through. We instructed them on how to walk through the scene. Nothing's been touched or disturbed as far as I know. All right, fine. Joe, Bill, you have this one? Yeah, is this the manager? Right, he's been shot twice in the abdomen as far as I can see. Wait, wait. Off one. Off one. What's that? You better get him rolling. You got somebody that can ride in with him? Already been arranged. I've got a man waiting at the ambulance. He's been briefed. Did he do much talking while you were waiting for the ambulance? He was just barely conscious. He kept mumbling something, but I couldn't understand. What did it sound like to you? Oft one is the way I made it. Could be. I just couldn't tell for sure. Oft one? Yeah, two words. O-F-T-O-N-E. Can't make much sense out of that, can you? No, but one thing sure, isn't it? What's that? It must have made sense to him. 5.25 p.m. Departmental orders provide that the senior or ranking investigator is to be in complete charge of a crime scene upon his arrival. In addition to notifying latent prints, photos, and laboratory personnel, three additional detective teams were requested to assist in the investigation. Sergeant Doherty was asked to organize an exterior search. Bill and I began preliminary examination of the crime scene. The front doors leading to the lobby were closed, but unlocked upon entry. Windows closed and latched, blinds halfway down. OK, the procedure for the search will be the lobby here, staircase to the first floor, then on up to the third. We'll use a cross-projection diagram. Photos next, 
Then we'll have Prince in. Now, after we make the first walkthrough, we can check and see if we can use one of the rooms to coordinate from. Right. All right. Victim number one. Small piece of red cloth in his right hand. There's a button on it. No signs of evidence around victim number two. Television tube broken. Particles of glass on the floor. What is that, a slug hole in the middle of the tube? That's what it is. The set's still plugged in. Apparent exit hole in the rear of the TV. And the entrance hole here in the wall. Looks like the height matches. Traces of plaster directly beneath the hole on the floor. OK, got it. Switch is in the on position. Mm -hmm. An expended shell casing. Nine millimeter. Looks like our suspect's holding an automatic. There might be more of these lying around, so let's be careful where we walk. If we find any more, we'll plot their location and include their positions on the diagram. Right. What do you make of those? Blood stains, palm prints. Looks like somebody took a walk, doesn't it? Yeah, from the angle of the prints, I'd say whoever left them was on the way up. I agree. The next question is up to where? Up to right here. They quit. Six ten p.m. We completed our preliminary examination of the multi-floor crime scene and gave initial directions to the police photographers. We established an investigation command post in the manager's apartment. The captain had assigned six additional detectives to assist in the investigation. We briefed and deployed each team. So the overall evidence is sketchy. There's a strong possibility the suspect's wearing a torn red shirt with a missing button. Evidence so far indicates the murder weapon is a 9mm. You ID'd the victims yet? Yeah, one of the tenants did. Now, supposedly all three of them live in the building. One of them was the manager. Their rooms have all been checked out in addition to the other 15 rooms in the building. All right, any other questions? OK, we'll coordinate everything from here. Now, you all have this telephone number. Somebody will be manning it at all times. If you find anything, check in. That's it. Captain? Egby? Thanks for sending the manpower, Captain. We sure need them. Forget the thanks. Let's just get results. Now, what do you got since you called me? No change. Three victims, two dead, one wounded. We've got a few bits of physical evidence, but nothing really significant so far. Witnesses? Nothing so far. The teams are out checking the neighborhood now. What about the weapon? All gunshot wounds, Captain. I think I told you that on the phone. We haven't come up with a weapon yet, but it looks like it's going to be a 9 millimeter. What makes you think so? Casings? Yes, sir. All right, what else? As far as the facts go, that's it. OK, so you've got no motive. What's the seat of your pants say? What is it? Some hype walks in here, juice to the gills, blows three people up? Argument, robbery, family dispute, what? It's like we said, Skipper. So far, there's just not much to go on. Well, let's get something. That's what we're getting paid for, right? Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, rotten migraine. I didn't mean to lean on you. It's just that my head's about to break. How about some aspirin? I left them in my desk. You got any on you, Bill? Sure I have, right here. Oh, must have run out. Bill Gannon walking the drugstore out of aspirin. Can you beat that? It's unheard of. Sorry, but you know, maybe you got a cold coming on, like me. That could give you a headache. Huh? What about some vitamin C? Best thing in the world for colds. Go ahead, take a couple. Yeah, well, thanks anyway, Bill. I think I'll get by. What's the latest on the wounded victim at the hospital? What's his name, Mort Baker? Yes, sir, it's been 30 minutes since we've heard anything. The last report had him listed as extremely critical. Anyone been able to talk with him yet? No, sir, he's been unconscious from the time he was taken from here. You have any ideas on that mumble jumble he muttered? What was that, off one? Yes, sir, we've gone over it a dozen times. I can't make anything out of it. Oft one. You sure that's what he said? Well, it was slurred, and he barely got it out. But the best I could tell, that's what it was. I think it could be a room number, maybe? We thought of that, too, Captain. There's a room number one on each of the three floors. The numbers are preceded by a letter. First floor is A, second B, third C, A1, B1, C1. They've all been checked out. When do you think we can talk to that wounded manager? It's Friday. Yeah. OK. There's your answer. The manager just died. Off to one. His last words nobody could understand. Yeah, we better try to make some sense out of it. It's the only lead we got. Maybe he meant off something. How's that? You know, off room one, off something. What do you think? No, sir, I definitely say it was OFT, like a word ending, oft. 
Oft, oft. Start at the beginning. What do you mean? A-O-F-T, B-O-F-T. You keep going, 24 left. Anything's worth a try. C-O-F-T, D-O-F-T. You sure can arrive at some oddball words this way. Wait a minute. Here's one that's maybe not so oddball. That makes sense to you? L-O-F-T. Loft, sure. A lot of these old apartment buildings have loft rooms. Usually out of the way, hard to find. It's worth a try. Go ahead, I'll cover the phone. Say, how about a vitamin B? Maybe you're just worn out and tired. I wasn't till this thing went down. 6.20 p.m. We proceeded to the third floor to follow up on our hunch. Nah, it looks like it wasn't such a good idea. I don't see anything that would indicate a loft room. Wait a minute. What about that? We'll need something to stand on. Yeah. This looks like it might be the door key. Somebody either hit it there or it got kicked under the rug. Smith? This thing is spring-loaded. It closes automatically. Power your flashlight, please. p.m. A preliminary examination of the loft room was conducted. The police photographers were directed to photograph the scene prior to an additional search and more thorough examination. We returned to brief the captain. Had his robe bone, lying in bed, door locked from the inside, and he's dead from a gunshot wound. Yes, sir, that's it. No evidence of a struggle, no casings around. Could be he wasn't shot inside the room. It's possible. It's not too logical he'd be running around in his bathrobe, though, is it? Uh, I don't know. At this point, I'd say anything was possible. It usually is. What do you have in mind now? Well, the photogs are covering the scene. As soon as they're through, I'll send latent prints up. Then we'll go through the room with a fine-tooth comb. Sergeant Friday, we've got the press outside. OK, bring them around the rear entrance and then up here, will you? All right. Go on, Arnold. Yes, sir? You've done a real good job protecting the scene so far. Keep at it. Let's don't lose anything now. Right, Sarge. You want to handle the interview, Skipper? It's your investigation, Joe. Yes, sir. Well, like you told Arnold, don't lose anything. Did you take one of these vitamin Bs? Yeah. But you feel a whole lot different now, don't you? Uh-huh. Worse. 6.45 p.m. Representatives of the news media had been waiting for 45 minutes. A few were faced with last-minute deadlines. They were anxious for information. Okay, gentlemen, now, if we can settle down here, I'll give you what I can. Right now, I can't give you too much. About 4.30 this afternoon, there was a shooting incident in this rooming house, which has resulted in the death of four persons, all male. Uh, Sergeant Friday Wood, City Press. What kind of evidence have you come up with so far? Only physical evidence. We have no eyewitnesses, so far at least. They're still looking. We have three teams knocking on doors and 15 uniformed officers checking the neighborhood. What kind of physical evidence, Sergeant? Well, right now, we can't measure the value of the evidence, and until we can, that information has to remain confidential. Do you have a suspect in custody? No, Phil, no suspects. What are you working on now, Joe? We're still going through the scene for evidence and reconstruction of the crime. You know the cause of death on each victim? Yes, sir. It appears that each died from gunshot wounds. 
You know what kind of a gun? Yes, sir. I believe we've narrowed that down. Oh, was there more than one weapon involved? Preliminary findings indicate a strong possibility there was only one gun used. What kind was it? Do you know? Yes, sir, we do, but I'm not at liberty to reveal that right now. Why not? It might damage the case, Mr. Woods. Joe, I remember Narco making a big raid in this building about two months ago. You figure these killings might be related? Well, it's a possibility, Jerry, but so far there's nothing that would indicate narcotic activity. I understand you found the bodies in different locations all over the building. What's that mean to you, Joe? It's not significant yet, Phil. Once we reconstruct the crime, it might give us some. What about a psycho angle? Seems to me nobody but a nut would do something like this. Well, that's possible, too. We're making background checks on everyone that's even casually involved here. Well, I'll give you five to one. You've got a gangland-style caper going here, Joe, and a big supply of narcotics is behind the whole thing. The suspect knocked off a dealer. The others were either his friends or eyewitnesses that could identify the killer. Jerry, you're as sharp as a marble. Okay, just a hunch, Joe. I'd call it 10 pounds of air. Maybe you and Friday ought to switch jobs. Not a bad idea. Maybe at least we'd get a better story. What about pictures, Joe? Can we grab a few? No pictures. Sorry, Jerry. Maybe later. I've already got one. Of what, Phil? I took it from the hallway on the way in. Beautiful shot at the two bodies in the lobby. Phil, I'm going to ask you for a favor. Sure, Joe. What is it? Don't use that picture. Why not, Joe? We need it for the racing final. I know, but any picture released to the public now could blow the case for us. There might be something in it that would prevent us from apprehending the suspect or cause us to lose a major key on the polygraph. That important, huh? That important, Phil. Now, what do you say? I say I don't use it until you give the okay. Thanks, pal. Your word's good enough. Is there anything else you can tell us, Joe? I got a deadline. That's about it, Jerry. It's just too early in the investigation to give you any more right now. Can we expect more later? You know we'll give you what we can. Good enough. Thanks, Joe. Not for very much, but thanks. It's not good enough for me, Sergeant. You know, I would have used that picture if my photo got it. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Woods, but I hope you can understand our position here. I'm sorry, too, but this is my first assignment in Los Angeles, and I want to turn in a good story. Your story will carry just as much as anyone else's will. I worked newspapers all over the Midwest before I came out here. There wasn't anything covered up by the police. They gave us everything we wanted. I'll make book they didn't, Mr. Woods, and the term isn't cover-up. We're not hiding anything here. It's a matter of conducting a responsible investigation. Responsible? Maybe, but at whose expense? You know as well as I do, the public has a right to be informed, and it's my job to do that. I could dream up more than you're giving. Mr. Woods, you and I both have an obligation to the public, now don't we? Yours is informing, mine is protecting. If we work together, we can perform a better service to the public, can't we? I can't do my job if the investigation is frustrated by publishing information that might provide the suspect an opportunity to escape prosecution or worse, be acquitted. That's your bag, Sergeant. Who are you to judge? You know the Bill of Rights establishes freedom of the press? Yes, sir, that's right. But there's somewhat of a conflict in the Bill of Rights that we both have to live with, don't we? And recently the Supreme Court has said so, whether we like it or not. How do you figure? The First Amendment is what you're referring to, right? Read the Sixth. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy a right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. Now, this case, with four dead people, will most likely gain nationwide attention. I'm sure it's already on the wires. Now, if the wrong information or incriminating evidence leading to the suspect is published, it's going to be impossible to get that impartial jury. The press has done a lot for us on other investigations. They put out information that helped us apprehend the suspect. A case like this will undoubtedly bring a dozen or so phony confessors. The evidence we withhold can mean the difference many times in not prosecuting the wrong man and in prosecuting the right one. I understand what you're saying, Sergeant, but how does that help me? I'm not getting the story I was sent out to get. Oh, I think you are, Mr. Woods, as much at least as anyone else is. And there's also a measure of satisfaction if you look at it a different way. How's that? The contribution we make by working together in the public interest. Yeah. It's really why we're both here, isn't it? I guess sometimes we lose sight of the future in our eagerness to grab a piece of the present, huh? Well, if we didn't once in a while, we wouldn't be human, would we? I think I just got a story, Sergeant. Thanks. I'm going on back to the office. Give me a yell if anything pops. Yes, sir. Did you ever think of transferring to public affairs? Where'd you learn all that stuff? From public affairs. Seven ten p.m. The investigation continued. Crime lab personnel had finished the scientific inspection. Bill and I coordinated and accepted the gathering of physical evidence. 7.25 p.m., the course of the investigation changed abruptly. At 7.10 p.m., investigators located a witness in the apartment building directly across the street who had observed a male Mexican wearing a white T-shirt run from the Grandee rooming house at the approximate time of the crime. His name's Pedro Martinez. Pretty frightened. We found him hiding in the garage across the street. Did you find a gun? No gun. He admits he was involved in the shooting of one guy here in the rooming house, but says it was self-defense. Well, how's that? Well, his story is he was coming down the steps from his girlfriend's room on the second floor. He saw this guy with a gun running around shooting. Martini says the guy put one shot into the TV set and then turned around and shot two men in the lobby. 
Martinis was scared and tried to run out of the building. The suspect stood in front of him and aimed right at his head. Martinis says he grabbed the suspect's wrist, fought with him, the gun went off, and the suspect had a hole in his chest. Martinis says that's how he got the blood on his T-shirt. What did he say happened then? He said the guy went down on his knees, that's the last he saw of him. Martinis ran out of the building and hid in the garage until we found him. How'd he describe the suspect? Male Caucasian, about 40, sandy-haired, six foot, 200 pounds. What about clothes? Only thing he could remember was a red shirt. The description matches our victim up in the loft room, except for that shirt. Yeah, SID threw that room up there. Should be. Let's shake it down. Seven thirty p.m. The photographers and latent print personnel had completed their work in the loft room. Carl Freeman, one of the print men, was packing up. Joe, Bill, you all through? Yeah, I found something. So did I. Red shirt. It's a bullet hole. Button missing from the sleeve. We can check for match against the piece we found in the hand of the victim by the TV set. Did you use a German Luger? We got work it in. Top drawer, right over there. Recently fired. I was just thinking, those guys from the press. What about them? They wanted a story. I guess maybe now we got one for them. Seven forty-five p.m. Bill called the captain to fill him in. He also called communications to find out who had placed the original unknown trouble call. We spent the next couple of hours comparing the scientific findings and physical evidence to the stories provided by Pedro Martinez, his girlfriend, and other casual witnesses. 9.45 p.m. The evidence, along with autopsy reports from the coroner's office, left a definite conclusion. We called a press conference. Don't tell us you're really going to give us a story, Joe. I'm afraid you might think so, Jerry, after you've heard it. Do you have a suspect? We do. Who is it? His name is Paul Andrews, deceased. Deceased? At 4.30 p.m. this afternoon, Paul Andrews called the complaint board at PAB about the residents in this building not tuning in the TV programs that he liked to watch. We have his voice on the tape downtown. But at that time, it didn't concern the detective division. You mean you monitored the call? The complaint board downtown monitors all calls, Mr. Woods. We found his by checking back on a possible motive. It's routine procedure. Who did he shoot first? Not who, Jerry. What? He put one hole through the TV tube down in the lobby. Then what? Andrews then shot two male tenants who happened to be down in the lobby watching television. He started upstairs for his room. On the way, he ran into a young man named Pedro Martinez, who was coming down from his girlfriend's apartment. The two men struggled at the foot of the stairs. The gun went off, fatally wounding Andrews. Then, with a 9 millimeter slug in his chest, Andrews proceeded to the second floor, shot the manager, climbed another flight of stairs, and up a loft stairway to his room. Now, gentlemen, I cannot give you the exact order in which the suspect did the following, but this is what he did. He locked the door. He removed whatever he was wearing, including a red shirt, which he stuck up on a shelf in his closet. He put on his bathrobe. He hid the Luger in a dresser drawer. Then he laid down on his bed and he died. The guy was obviously a psycho. Probably never had a straight thought in his life. Sergeant, man here needs some help. I'm looking for the manager. Like to know what room Paul Andrews is in? Yes, sir. Can I help you? Got a package for him. TV set. He ordered it yesterday. just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 3rd, a coroner's hearing was held in and for the county of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that hearing. The coroner's jury ruled the death of Paul Andrews was a result of self-defense. The other three deaths were found to be criminal homicide at the hands of the deceased suspect, Paul Andrews. <laughs> 